it's wonderful to be here today. Thank you for being a participant in the worship service. I go to so many places where the congregation doesn't participate in the praise and the worship, but you did that in a magnificent way. I love what God is doing at Truett McConnell College. I love your president and the administration and the staff. And I don't particularly like to go to meetings, but I seek opportunities to go to the trustee meetings here just to hear the reports about what God is doing and also to be inspired and to hear the vision of the president. So it's good to be here today. I, I'm just a paper boy. I'm just a newspaper reporter. I understand that uh, there was this young journalist who was situated in this small town where there was little opportunity for advancement. I mean, he was getting absolutely nowhere. He was just writing social news and the obituary column, but he was hoping that he could write a story that would be picked up by the Associated Press or by some syndicated columnist, but there he was, stuck in this small town, and he was absolutely miserable. But one day, the dam above the town burst and flooded the town with water, and he thought this just might be his opportunity to write a story that would be picked up by the Associated Press. So he got in a boat, began to maneuver around town. The water was up to the awnings of most houses. And as he maneuvered around town, he saw this woman perched on a roof, seated next to the chimney. He got up on the roof with her, sat down beside her, explained what he was after. And it was not very long after that until the headboard of a bed floated by. And she said, now there's your story. He looked at it for a moment and shook his head and he said, no, that's not what I'm looking for. A few moments after that, a piece of pulpit furniture from the local church floated by. She said, now there's a story. He looked at that, shook his head and said, no, that's not what I'm looking for either. About five minutes after that, there was a hat that floated by, made a 180 degree turn, floated upstream, made another 180 degree turn, floated downstream, made another 180 degree turn and floated upstream again. He said, now there is a story. She said, no, that's not a story. That's my husband Hayford. He said, he's going to cut the grass today come hell or high water. And now that is commitment and I hope that you'll be committed to the challenge that you have accepted in graduating from college and pursuing uh, God's plan for your life. I do want to speak to you this morning on the resurrection. If you happen to bring your Bible today, I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first eight verses. We could well read all the verses of this chapter because they all pertain to the resurrection, but I think the first eight verses will suffice for this time. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you join with me once again as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father in heaven, I have believed for most of my ministry that the greatest chance for revival in America is among the young people and the college students. They don't quite have the hang-ups and the idols and the materialistic bent that most of us who are older have. Many of them are willing to yield their lives to you. And I pray, Father, that today you would do anything in us that you need to do, that you might be able to do everything through us that you want to do, that your name might be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The resurrection of Christ. 
there was a Muslim in Africa who was com uh, converted to Christianity. One of his friends encountered him one day and said, why in the world did you convert to Christianity? And he said, well, it's like this. Suppose you were going down a road, and all of a sudden the road forked in two directions, and you didn't know which way to go. But in the fork in the road there were two men, one living and one dead. Which one would you ask for directions? I thought that was a pretty good explanation because we have a Savior who lives. As C.S. Lewis aptly reasoned, you cannot simply call Jesus Christ a good man. For he was either, number one, a liar who claimed to be God and was not, or he was a lunatic who thought he was God and was not, or number three, he was Lord. He's exactly who he claimed to be, and he is alive forevermore. You see, Jesus is the only one who claimed to be alive before Abraham and predicted that he would indeed come back from the dead. Three things I'd like for us to see in this passage of Scripture. First of all, I want us to notice the prelude to the resurrection. There are some things that had to take place before Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Now these are elementary, but they are essential. Number one, before Jesus Christ could be raised from the dead, he had to die. In verse 3 of our text, the Bible says, Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. And we all know that he died by means of crucifixion. Crucifixion involved excruciating pain. In fact, one doctor said... When Jesus was on the cross, he suffered hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, partial intermittent asphyxiation, and searing pain as his torn flesh was lacerated and torn again as he moved up and down against the rough-hewn timbers of the cross. You see... There are some people who decry Christianity and declare it a bloody gospel. Some say that we have a slaughterhouse religion. There are some folks who want to take the blood songs out of our worship. I had a professor in college who said that what Jesus experienced on the cross was only a minor inconvenience and that he was not nailed to the cross, he was tied to the cross. But don't you believe that? Jesus suffered in agony and pain for your sins and for my sins. In fact, the Bible tells us that we only have access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. For it says, we who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. He died. Secondly, before he could be raised from the dead, he had to be buried. In verse 4 it says, and that he was buried. In Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60, we're told that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and requested the body of Jesus that he might bury him in his newly dug grave which had been hewn out of a rock. That he would roll a stone in front of the entrance of the tomb in order to secure the body of Jesus. The very next day, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, went to Pilate and asked him to place soldiers at the entrance of the tomb so that nothing would happen to the body of Jesus. Pilate did that so that no one would steal the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus died, it just seemed that death was all wrong and that death had won. In fact, if you look at history, it seems so often that death is wrong. For example, when Cain killed Abel, who offered a more excellent sacrifice to God, it seemed like death had won. Noah escaped the flood, but he still died, and once again it seemed like death had won. Isaiah was an eagle-eyed prophet who could see thousands of miles and thousands of years ahead, but he still died, and it seemed like death had won. Habakkuk was a prophet who spoke the truth so powerfully and so profoundly and he lived so close to God, but yet he died and once again it seemed like death had 
one. In the 80s, I was pastor of a church in Jackson, Mississippi, and I often would go to Memphis to try to have some fellowship with Dr. Adrian Rogers, who was my mentor and my hero. I believe he is the one that really held the Southern Baptist Convention together for uh, more than a quarter of a century. And when he died in November of 2005, I went to his funeral. I sat there, and I thought that once again, death was so wrong, and it seemed that day like death had won. Throughout history, it, there have been great surgeons and great musicians and great artists and great philosophers and great preachers who died, and it seems that no matter how bright or brilliant they were, they died and that once again death had won. But I want you to know that 2,000 years ago, like two gladiators in an arena, death and love fought. In fact, love rolled up its sleeves in that arena, and love said to death, now death You've been bullying people around far too long. But I've come to set the record straight. Love is stronger than death. And that day, death and love fought all over Jerusalem, all the way up to the brow of Golgotha, and all the way down into the grave. And fi finally, death said to love, See, I did to you just like I did to all the rest of them. Hell had a holiday. It was one of those long weekend parties that started late on Friday evening and went all the way through Saturday night. But on Sunday morning, I want you to know that love rolled up his sleeves and pulled the sting out of death and the victory out of the grave and proved that love is greater than death. But you see, the prelude to the resurrection is that Jesus had to die and he had to be buried. But secondly, we come to the proofs of the resurrection. We live in a skeptical society today, a society that demands evidence. We say that the victim of Calvary is loose and at large. But the world says, prove it. We want some evidence. And indeed, there is ample evidence that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. In fact, in Acts 1-3, we're told that his resurrection is authenticated by many infallible proofs. Well, now, what are those proofs? Let me give you several. First of all, there is the empty tomb. It is commonly believed among Christians that three days after Jesus died, the tomb was empty. In fact, all four gospel writers are in complete agreement that the tomb of Jesus Christ was empty three days after he died. Now, one of the theories that is proposed by those who do not wish to believe the resurrection is that the disciples of Jesus came and stole his body away. In fact, the chief priests and the scribes, according to Matthew 28, verses 12 through 15, paid the soldiers a large sum of money and said to them, Tell anyone who asks that his disciples came and stole his body away at night while we slept. The Bible says that the soldiers took the sum of money and they promised that they would do exactly that and this saying is still commonly reported among the Jews until this very day. But you see, it, common sense will tell you that that simply did not happen. That argument did not convince very many people. I mean, it doesn't make sense that these fearful disciples would steal the body of Jesus and then pretend that he had been raised from the dead. I mean, just three days earlier, these same disciples had fled for their lives when they heard that Jesus had been arrested and crucified. And it's highly unlikely that they would have screwed up enough courage to steal the body of Jesus and then go forth to boldly proclaim his resurrection at the risk of their own lives. In fact, John 20, 19 says that they were hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. The only other possible explanation is that his enemies stole his body. 
But what possible motivation did they have for doing so? They were the ones that wanted him dead because they considered him a threat to their system of religion and to their way of life. The last thing that they would want was for anyone to think that he was alive again. So there's the empty tomb. Secondly, there are the eyewitness accounts. Well, let me say this. Secondly, there's the fulfilled prophecy. Because if you'll notice in verse 4, it says, Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Well, what Scripture? The Old Testament Scriptures pertaining to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For example, in Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, David said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor allow thy Holy One to see corruption. David could look down the corridors of time with a telescope of faith and see that death and hell had absolutely no power over Jesus Christ. Jesus himself predicted his own death and resurrection. In Matthew chapter 2, he said, The Son of Man goeth up to Jerusalem, where he shall be delivered into the hands of the chief priests and the scribes, who shall condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles who shall mock him and scourge him and spit upon him and kill him, but the third day he will rise from the dead. And in John chapter 2, he was talking to the Jews, and he said, You destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had been raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed all the scriptures and the words which he had spoken. And so you see, the truth is that the resurrection is the amen of all the prophecies and the promises in the word of God. We have a gospel that does not proclaim a Christ who was living and is dead, but a Christ who was dead and is alive again. So there's the empty tomb. There's the fulfilled prophecy. And then there are the eyewitness accounts. Because if you'll notice in our passage of Scripture, there are several eyewitness accounts that Paul specifies. First of all, he was, Paul says he was seen of Cephas and then the twelve disciples. Now Cephas would be Peter. By the way, some of the disciples would not have been very easy to convince. Take, for example, Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. In fact, Thomas said, Unless I see the print of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the print of the nails and put my hand in his side, which you remember was pierced with a spear, he said, I will not believe. Well, after Jesus had risen from the dead, he gave Thomas the privilege of putting his finger in the nail print and his hand in the side. And I can just uh, picture Thomas falling down and saying, My Lord and my God, which the Scripture says that he said. John would not have been particularly easy to convince either. He was a kind of a mystical, analytical disciple. And yet, in the first chapter of his first epistle, he talks about the risen Christ And he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which our eyes have seen, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled, that we declare unto you. And then if you'll notice, it says that he was seen of 500 brethren at one time. In fact, Paul goes on to say there are a lot of these folks who are still alive today. Go ask them. You know, in the Bible, anything could be established among two or three witnesses And yet we have 500 brethren at one time. Let me tell you something. There's one thing that you don't do. If you're trying to propagate a lie about a certain event, you don't go ask the people who are eyewitnesses to that event. Here's something else. It says that he was seen of James. Now this was not James, the brother of John, one of the sons of thunder. This was James, the half-brother of Jesus. James, the brother of John, was killed early on by Herod. So this is the half-brother of Jesus. 
And he would have been a hard person to convince as well because for many years he did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. But sometime after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his half-brother and his half-brother James was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah and his life was changed. And then it says he was seen of the twelve disciples again and then Paul says... At the last, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Now, you talk about somebody that would be hard to convince. That was the Apostle Paul. He'd been a persecutor of the church. He was a thinker. He was a debater. He was a philosopher. He was not about to be deceived by any kind of phony baloney. And yet, when he saw the risen Christ, his life was changed, and he gave up all of his credentials in Jewish academia and he identified himself with this one whom all of his friends and associates had rejected. And so there's the eyewitness account of the apostles. And then there's the martyrdom of the apostles as well. Now you think about this. If the resurrection were not a reality, if it never happened, if it was a lie, why would these apostles give up their very lives in order to proclaim it. In fact, not only did they preach the resurrection, but they demonstrated that they were willing to die rather than deny it. And if you read church history, you'll discover that every single one of the apostles, uh, the apostles with the exception of John, who was tortured and sent into exile, demonstrated that they were willing to die rather than cease to preach the message of the resurrection. D. James Kennedy said that this is a tremendously important fact because in the history of psychology it has never been known that anyone was willing to die for something which they knew to be a lie. Peter. He was severely scourged and then crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. John was put into a cauldron of boiling oil and then exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Philip was scourged and then crucified. Paul was beheaded. Mark was dragged to death. Bartholomew was flayed. That means he was skinned to death, skinned and then crucified. James was thrown from a tower of the temple and then beaten to death. Luke was hung from an olive tree. Thaddeus was pierced through with arrows. Thomas was pierced with a spear and then thrown into the flames of an oven. You see, this is evidence of the resurrection. Let me give you one other proof of the resurrection. And that is the establishment of the church. Someone has said that the empty tomb of Jesus Christ is the cradle of the church. And uh, Paul's argument for conversion was the resurrection. He said there can be no conversion without the resurrection. And when he preached on the day of Pentecost, which was about seven weeks after the crucifixion, there were many people there who had seen Jesus crucified. They knew what had happened. And 3,000 of them were converted and baptized that day. And if you look in verses 12 through 19 of this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, you'll find that, that Paul says that the resurrection is absolutely essential for our salvation and for the existence of the church. I could give you many other reasons as well. Josephus, the Jewish historian, testifies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What possible motivation would he have for saying that if it were not true? There was a man by the name of Frank Morrison about 25 years ago who wrote a book entitled Who Moved the Stone? Frank Morrison was an atheist. He set out to validate his own atheism, but once he had done his research, he realized that he was wrong and that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. And the conclusion of his book involves an the intimation that Christ himself moved the stone. R.A. Torrey said that the resurrection is the Gibraltar of our faith and the Waterloo of rationalism and infidelity. So there you have, first of all, the 
prelude to the resurrection, then you have the proofs of the resurrection, then I want to say a word to you about the power of the resurrection. And let me just say that the, the resurrection produces life. We've already sung about it this morning. The resurrection produces life. In that verse 8, Paul says, And last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. I'm certainly not a Greek scholar, but I understand that the phrase born out of due time is the translation of one Greek word, ektromati, which can mean abortion. In other words, Paul says, before I met Christ, I was nothing more than a dead fetus. Judaism had completely aborted me. I was utterly devoid of life until I met Jesus Christ. But then, of course, he met Jesus Christ. His life was changed. You remember that experience on the Damascus Road? He saw the celestial light, heard the celestial voice. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the response came back, I am Jesus. Paul was shocked. He thought Jesus was dead. But he met Jesus on the Damascus Road and was given life. And all of a sudden, every fiber of his being began to pulsate with divine life. And Jesus Christ can give each one of us that kind of life and also the power to communicate that resurrection life to others. And if we've been saved, we need to be walking in a newness of life. Have you ever heard about Jeremy Bentham? Jeremy Bentham was an Englishman, a jurist, an economist, a philanthropist, a philosopher. He was a rather eccentric individual, had a lot of idiosyncrasies in his life. When he died on June the 6th, 1832, he had requested that his body be dissected in the front of his family and friends. A rather unusual request. Once his body was dissected, his skeletal remains were preserved, clothed. He was given a wax head in the form and shape of his original head, which was mummified. He's placed in a glass casket in University College in London, England. You can see it today. Before he died, he bequeathed a large sum of money to one of the hospitals in London with this stipulation, that his remains be placed at the head table at each board meeting. And for a hundred years, his body was placed at the head table of the board meetings when the hospital board met. And for a hundred years, the secretary would record the minutes, and at the end of the minutes, she would write, Jeremy Bentham, present, but not voting. Can you imagine going to a board meeting with a dead man? But you know, we interact with dead people all the time. People who are spiritually dead. We see them on the street. We see them in the grocery store. We see them at the filling station. We see them in the barber shop, in the beauty salon, in the mall, in the theater, in the restaurants, perhaps even in your own dormitory. Dead people everywhere. Because if we're not Christians, we're dead. The Bible says, Peter, when he, uh, uh, Paul, when he wrote Timothy, said, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. When he wrote the church at Ephesus, he said, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So if you're a believer, you have life. If you're not a believer, you need life that comes through Jesus Christ. Because there's not any real life apart from him. Let me close with a story. This is a story that was told by Tony Campolo. I'm not a fan of Tony Campolo. I believe that he's basically a socialist. But he claims to be a Baptist. He was a teacher in a college in Pennsylvania. And he is a great storyteller. He said when he was 16 years old, he went to his first black funeral. He said it was incredible. A friend of his father's died. A man who was a deacon in the church in his hometown and so he went to this church that was predominantly black and he said the pastor was just amazing he spoke with such authority that people sat on the edge of their seats to listen to what he had to say and when he preached the funeral of this man he talked to the whole congregation to start with he talked about the resurrection and how if we believe on Jesus Christ we'll be raised up immortal and and uh, 
incorruptible. He said it was a marvelous story and message for the congregation. Then he went over to a, a small group in the congregation, which was the family, and he spoke words of comfort and consolation to them. He said that was so marvelous because the solace and the comfort that was provided by the pastor was just amazing. And after he had spoken to the whole congregation for 20 minutes and to the family for 20 minutes, he went to the casket and said, now I'm going to speak to the corpse. What must it be like, you might ask, to speak to a corpse? Ask any Baptist preacher. They can probably tell you. The lid of the casket was open and he started to speak and he said, Clarence, there's some things that we should have told you while you were living, but we failed to do that, so we're going to tell you now. And he talked about how Clarence had shoveled the snow for the widow lady that lived next to them on the same street. He talked about how he'd taken food to those who were poor and impoverished. He talked about how he'd been an usher and a greeter in the church, how he'd taught a class of teenage boys in the church, how he'd served as a deacon in the church, what a faithful, godly man he was, and when he had talked for about 20 minutes to Clarence, he said, well, now, Clarence, that's about all there is to say. And when there's nothing else to say, there's only one thing to say. Good night, Clarence. And he reached up and got the lid of the coffin and slammed it shut. Bang! Now, you talk about drama. That's drama. He said, good night, Clarence. Good night, Clarence. And he lifted up his head, and there was a smile on his face. And he said, good night, Clarence, because we know you're going to have a glorious morning. And with that, the choir stood up and they started singing in that great getting up morning, we shall rise, we shall rise. And the congregation stood up and they started singing the same thing. And he said, that day I decided I want to be a member of that black church because they knew how to take a funeral and turn it into a celebration. You see, because of Jesus Christ and His resurrection, he can turn all of our sunsets into sunrises if we will simply trust in Him. Would you bow with me in prayer just now? I don't know if there is a desire in your heart to trust in Jesus Christ, but if you do not know Him, I'm afraid I must tell you that you are dead, spiritually dead. But I'm delighted to tell you that today you may have life. Life in Jesus Christ, if you will but trust Him as your only Savior. Father in heaven, I pray just now for these wonderful college students who are pursuing an education, preparing for a career, looking forward to the future. And I pray that there will not be a single student here who will face the future without the life the vibrancy, the purpose, the direction that Jesus Christ can give to a human being. And Father, I pray if there's one here who does not know Christ, that before they leave this building, they will speak to a professor or to another student and let them know that they want to have Jesus Christ in their life so that they might themselves have that vi vibrancy of life that only Jesus can provide. For it's in His name that we pray.